Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Harvey Mansfield, and this is the program on constitutional government at Harvard. Our guest today is Mark Mills, who's an expert on energy. Mark Mills is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a faculty fellow at the Northwestern University McCormick School of Engineering. He's also a strategic partner with Montrose Lane, which is an energy tech venture fund. And he's written books. He's the author of a book, The Cloud Revolution, How the Convergence of New Technologies Will Unleash the Next Economic Boom and uh, in the Roaring 2020s. And he's a host of the podcast, The Last Optimist. Uh, he's uh, appeared in several newspapers, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, any real, real clear politics, appeared on TV with CNN, Fox, NBC, PBS, The Daily Show. He was named Energy Writer of the Year by the American Energy Society. <clears throat> he um, holds a degree in physics from Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. He's Canadian or used to be a Canadian, maybe still is. So this is Mark Mills, and he's going to speak on the energy transition delusion. <laughs> Thank you very much, Harvey. Let me do a screen share. Just to, I assume everybody can see this now? Yes, we can see this. All right. Let's see, we have, okay. I did a slight bait and switch on the title from the delusion to the great energy reset because delusion seems provocative, although I like to think words have meaning. And as I'll show in a minute, there isn't a transition going on. So it sort of meets the, the definition of the, the claims that we're having an accelerating transition since it's not in the data would suggest or some, 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 uh, some manner of delusionary uh, thinking on this, but. Let's talk about facts. So let me do, I'm gonna, happy to talk with everybody about ideas and things that you might find that you might disagree with or things I don't cover, but let me, let me do a couple, couple dozen slides to frame, to frame the whole, the whole issue of uh, the energy transition. But I, if I may <clears throat> start with an observation to frame what we're about, and it may be obvious to all of you, but I think it's important for contexting given the centrality of energy, food and fuel. fuel. Food, of course, is fuel for humans and animals, uh, and uh, they're both forms of energy. And all of history, one of the things that's been remarkable about the change that's occurred, and this is only through the last 700 years of history, so it's not all of history, but it's a, it's a long time period. If you trace it back further in time, the graph looks similar. The, the most remarkable thing about our era, our time in history, is that the share of our economies devoted to acquiring food and fuel have collapsed. Put differently, for most of history, the share of a GDP of every, any country that's devoted to just getting food and fuel, somewhere between 50 and 80 percent, all economies, total economic activity is consumed no pun intended, by getting fuel, fuel needed for food and food for humans. That I think is beyond obvious why it collapsed at the beginning of the industrial revolution was the beginning of the age of hydrocarbons. And it led to that ratio dropping from 50 to 80% to roughly 15%. The, the cost of food and fuel combined 10 to 15% of global GDPs, and GDPs expanded. This is important for a lot of reasons, not least, even if economies didn't expand, and they did because of technology, if, if they hadn't, this meant that money in economies are freed up to do other things other than survival. Money is freed up to protect the environment. Money is freed up for education, for healthcare, for entertainment, all the things that you know humans like to spend time on other than survival. So the centrality of the fact that Nothing exists without energy. Nothing is possible. No services, no products. Nothing, nothing is possible without acquiring energy in an affordable way that's delivered in some, some reliable fashion. 
if you took that long time period and just looked more recently at the last century and going out into the next decade or two, the remarkable thing about the energy component of the share of GDP globally that's consumed by fuels is that it was very stable for all the 20th century, all the 19th, all, all the entire 20th century, you saw this portion of the global GDP devoted to buying fuel to survive and to operate society, you know, a few percent of GDP. This, you know, obviously GDP is expanding rapidly over this period. And then of course the modern era, which really began with the Arab oil embargo of 1973, when we had this massive increase, overnight increase in the cost of oil and uh, therefore the cost of energy as a share of GDP. That that resolves itself, so to speak. We have to go, and then we had a long interregnum where energy costs were relatively low as a share of GDP. Then we had another price spike. And then we have, of course, the most recent one. The forecast that you see in this, this graph of the share of global GDP devoted to purchasing fuel uh, are, are based on the assumption that oil and gas and coal will get cheap again. They're not based on the assumption that wind and solar will take a large share of the world's energy because they're a tiny share now, which I'll get to. But whether that forecast happens or not will depend on perhaps an obvious uh, guess of the future. It's whether the world is oversupplied or undersupplied in oil, gas, and coal. I mean, the costs of, of energy are attached are associated with the obvious things in, in the dynamics of all commodities, whether the markets are over or undersupplied. If markets are undersupplied, prices go up and stay up until they're oversupplied. I mean, it's not a complicated principle in economics. Before I talk about the transition, let me also just make a philosophical point that's important here, is that energy demand doesn't come from the, uh, the discovery of energy sources per se. Uh, energy demand comes from innovation. Innovators, entrepreneurs, engineers have for all of history been much, much more productive in finding new ways to use energy than they have in finding new ways to produce it. If you counter the number of inventions that produce energy versus the number of inventions that consume energy, the asymmetry is staggering. It, it's obvious to state, but it's worth stating because it has relevance to our forecasting. All the plans that are being done on energy transition are anchored in forecasts, a priori. So if we want to think about the future, we should sort of think in these terms about what's happened in the past, that... What I'm showing here is our four classes of invention of things that didn't exist prior to their invention and their energy implications. It, so beyond obvious, when the auto age took off, oil demand to run automobiles also took off. It's it's important to notice, it was, note, and I'll explain why in a second, that the, the inflection point for the automobile era, roughly the early 1920s, came about 25 years after the um, invention it was more than 30 years after the invention, but 25 years after the invention of automobiles that people purchased. There were hundreds of automobile companies in the world between 1900 and 1920. The world had millions of automobiles, but the automobile age didn't take off till the automobile became affordable, broadly speaking, reliable enough, manufacturable at scale, which is roughly mid early 1920s. The same can be true of the aviation era. There were airplanes before the Boeing 707. That was the first practical commercial aircraft that saw the aviation age take off the, some 25 years after the invention of aircraft. And so we went from zero, essentially zero oil used to fly to more than 8 million barrels per day. Same is true of the pharmaceutical age and the polymer and chemical age. You know, global, global pharma was non-existent uh, uh, until roughly the late 20s and early 30s. There had been pharmaceuticals and there were chemical industries for at least two and a half decades prior to that. But it's also an industry that went from consuming essentially no energy to consuming on the order of 15 million barrels per day. It was saying the truth, the computer, computers require power. Uh, there were no, before computers, there was no electricity used to run computers. I mean, self-evidently, <laughs> I guess. But what's surprising to most people is if you think about the two things, the pivot and the computing era, the first pivot, it was roughly the mid-60s with the advent of practical computers, where we went from a few hundred to a few thousand of the world to tens of thousands and then millions of computers. Globally, the infrastructure associated with computing now uses more energy than the 
global infrastructure of aviation. In fact, put in electricity terms, global computing uses roughly twice as much electricity as the country of Japan does for all purposes. So th th this just the, the point of this is obvious, right? Inventions create demand, but the demand for energy that's created from those inventions is significant only after you reach an inflection point from those inventions. They become practical and deploy, start to deploy at scale. So the question you would have to ask yourself on the demand side is whether we've stopped inventing new ways of consuming energy, not different ways of, of, of using the same tools, like different kinds of cars. Electric car is still a car. It's energy consumption per car is sort of roughly the same as old cars. What's different about the future than our present will be the advent of the commercial deployment at scale of things like you know, drones, robots that are anthropomorphic, telemedicine and bioelectronics, the cloud in the sense that it's different than the internet, obviously artificial intelligence, which is a pretty hot topic now, chat GPT and the like, virtual and augmented reality. The, these, are, these are all technologies that are, as from our time perspective, have been around for a couple decades, in some cases more than two decades, 20 to 30 years, of technology development in every one of these classes of technology, we're now on the cusp in this decade of these kinds of technologies reaching inflection points of commercial utility. That means that they will use energy to be fabricated and built, and they will use energy to operate. Robots are a lot like automobiles in terms of their energy intensity to manufacture. Um, they typically aren't energy intensive to use, whereas things like artificial intelligence uh, significantly energy intensive to manufacture the computational capabilities to do chat GPT. But the energy consumption of artificial intelligence is roughly a thousand fold higher than the energy consumption of traditional computing. It's an astonishingly energy intensive activity with some very useful um, functionality, which subject for another lecture. The other things that change forecasts for energy demand are consumer preferences and consumer behavior. I'm doing energy demand because it says a lot about what's going to happen in the future of how we're going to supply the demands for the world. Globally, there, the quantity of cars in the world is growing with, with wealth. That's perhaps obvious. Uh, in, in the United States, there are more cars than there are registered drivers. There are almost as many vehicles as there are human beings in the United States. But the important thing is not just that the rest of the world is, is following the United States and Europe in terms of car ownership is the those countries become wealthier. Here we have essentially, you know, one car per human being. In most of the world, there are roughly 10 human beings per car. So where there are billions of people who don't have cars, we'll see them buying cars, which will require energy to manufacture, obviously energy to operate. The interesting underlying trend is the preference that consumers have in the kind of cars they want. United, United States, it's beyond obvious that the SUVification, if you like, the preference for large vehicles, the SUV, uh, is clear and what automakers are selling based on what people are buying. We've gone from SUVs accounting for about a quarter of all cars purchased to half. If you add pickup trucks to this for the United States, you get the 75%, by the way. This is not a US trend. It's a trend going on in Europe and in China and the rest of the world. Uh, in fact, the IEA, this is IEA data, International Energy Agency, has pointed out that the increased demand for SUVs by consumers globally will lead to greater energy use to operate them because they're bigger and heavier. And that greater use of energy, oil specifically, because SUVs are typically and will be for some time oil fired, uh, offsets the oil save by the expectation of having 150, more million, 150 million more EVs on the road. The other energy driving trend, of course, is house sizes. Houses take a lot of energy to build. They take energy to operate. It's one-to-one uh, -one correlated with the house size. This is U.S. data. We see the same thing around the world in, in, in wealth terms. The typical size of the first home uh, keeps getting bigger. It oscillates depending on economic cycles, but by and large, you can see the trend line is up. And it's up pretty significantly over just the last two decades, up roughly 20%. The other behavioral trends, which I'll, I'll mention briefly because they have relevance to oil and cars and aspirations for the electrification of the transportation sector fall in where people are living in the United States. So the your left graph is a domestic migration trends in the United States. This is net migration from uh, to urban areas and net migration to rural counties in the United States. 
you can see before the great lockdowns from the pandemic that the net migration to rural areas was already rising and the net out migration from urban areas was already happening despite all the constant blather uh, for a couple last couple of decades that millennials would choose to live in cities and never 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 ever go to exurban areas or rural areas the data didn't show that the data showed that there was a net migration out of cities of course the lockdowns uh, accelerated that during during the 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 year of the lockdown imposition 20% of americans moved which was the epic biggest in history um, it's hard to know how many people will move back to urban areas some already are jp morgan did a survey on this came to the conclusion that they think roughly half of the people who moved out of cities will move back but if you even if you assume that it was it was a significant acceleration of a migration of the american population into exurban and rural areas which beyond it's beyond obvious that has energy implications if you're trying to forecast uh, demands for transportation or for housing houses tend to be bigger in rural areas people buy bigger houses there they tend to be further apart and they also the op, it, it is also uh, beyond obvious that there aren't uh, subways and uh, railroads in those areas. People are driving more and driving further distances. If you think about the macro trend on flying as one of the big vectors for guessing future oil demand, uh, you can look at passenger miles globally, fuel use, but the easiest metric is the obvious one. If you if you correlate GDP per capita, per capita wealth, with average number of passenger kilometers flown per capita, you see something very obvious. There's an astonishing increase with very modest increases in per capita wealth. Most of the world's per capita wealth, most people in the world live below $20,000 GDP per capita. Uh, so you can see that very, very modest increases in global wealth are going to lead to really astonishing increases in global air traffic, which you could, you could in principle model this, but it's pretty hard given the how how sensitive this is to very small changes. And it and that that correlation continues to very high levels of wealth. The US per capita GDP is as you probably all know is in the 80 to 90 thousand dollars per per capita. Uh, whether people will, will continue to behave this way or not is obviously uh you have to say is speculative, but there's no evidence in history that they won't continue to behave this way. So let's look at the supply side. So the, the trends are obvious. There's more people. There's more wealth. Absent uh, economic cycles, which we may be we may be going through now, courtesy of the Fed. Uh, on average, uh, the world has grown in wealth, and it's grown in its consumption of energy. This is a very a very simple graph, it's common in every text or article. It's not hard to find the data, whether you're using IEA data or EIA data or World Bank data. Uh, what this tells you is that over the last uh, 30 years, uh, the world's overall consumption of energy has increased rather substantially. Uh, the quantity of hydrocarbons consumed in absolute terms has increased by an amount equal to, in energy equivalent terms, adding six Saudi Arabia's worth of energy supply. Uh, what's also happened over that time is we've spent a lot of money on non-hydrocarbon energy sources. The world has spent somewhere between five and ten trillion dollars since the year 2000 to avoid using hydrocarbons you can see the evidence of an energy transition in this is it there i mean if after 20 years of climate awareness uh and on the order of 10 trillion dollars of, of, of aggregate spending in the western world to avoid hydrocarbons most of this has been on wind and solar a lot of it's been on ethanol and biofuels some some has been on hydro, but most of it's been wind and solar. Uh, what you see is that the world today has about three percent of its energy supply from wind and solar. As as a framing point for why I say that the energy transitions are slow, and that it's delusional to think that we're in a rapid transition. I mean, obvious. I offer this graph as Exhibit A that there's no rapid transition going on. That is, this data do not show any evidence of a quote rapid transition. More importantly, in terms of the challenge of the magnitude of you know changing how the world uses energy at, at the macro level wood burning wood not wood as a, as a construction material burning wood today globally supplies three times more energy than all the world's wind and solar utility scale and consumer installations combined even in the united states uh burning wood for energy is uh, 50 percent of wind and solar if you compared wood to 
just solar, by the way, wood, wood currently supplies more energy than solar arrays in America. That, that'll change. The wood share will shrink. In absolute terms, by the way, the quantity of wood energy used today to supply the world isn't much different than it was 100 years ago. It's just the world's a lot bigger. So you don't have energy transitions. You have you have energy additions over time, which is what, if you drew this further back in history, you would see the same phenomenology. It is unequivocally the case that the share of wind and solar will keep rising. Now, we're gonna, we've spent a lot of money on it. We're going to keep spending lots more money on it. The technologies are better than they ever were. They're getting they're getting better uh, uh, and will continue to get better. We will, we will see that wedge expand, but that's not an accelerating transition. So what we have instead are um, aspirations as opposed to uh, actual performance. This is just looking just at the U United States in terms of the expectation for accelerating a transition away from hydrocarbons towards renewables broadly, uh, renewables being not just wind and solar in this case, but also hydropower uh, and uh, wood and ethanol and biofuels. This is US, the red line is the share of US energy coming from renewables. And as you can see, it's risen uh, significantly uh, in the last two decades. And that uh, about a third of that is ethanol. And the two thirds of the rest of that increase in the share of renewable energy is in fact, wind and solar. Uh, the dotted lines are forecasts that were made by smart people, uh, serious uh, people, organizations uh, over the past uh, 40 years. The beginning of the dotted line is the year the forecast was made, and the end of the dotted line is the forecast for the share of U.S. energy that would come from renewables made by each organization or person at the point they did it. So now what you can see from that is, is, is sort of self-evident in the illustration. Uh, the aspirations or forecast for the increased share of renewable energies were vastly more uh, optimistic and enthusiastic than what actually happened. Now we have the, the Green New Deal. Which is the Inflation Reduction my, Act. My um, chair, my my, my Martha, video. Martha, I, Martha, you have to mute yourself. Oh, done. Sorry. <laughs> so you know, I guess the question you'd have to ask is this time different. I mean, we now we're now into you know 2022, 23. We're going to spend a lot of money <clears throat> on on the Green New Deal as as it's been you know framed as a, a short form for the the uh, energy transition. Uh, are we gonna get to in 20 years, 25 years, more than half of US energy coming from renewables? And most of that is gonna be wind and solar in terms of how the money is planned to be deployed. I mean, if, if you saw a graph like, graph like this, and this was um, you know, investment advisors telling you what your in return on investment would be at any given time, and they'd failed this abysmally, you probably wouldn't trust them anymore. But when it comes to energy forecasts, we don't have quite the same standards for credibility. Uh, but that's the nature of the beast. So let's turn this turn this uh, to a global perspective uh, in terms of forecasts of the need. This is aspirational again, and uh, but the need to, to use uh, to supply more of the world's energy from non non hydrocarbons from carbon free energy sources. And carbon-free, this, this to be clear again, the International Energy Agency's forecasts and all the forecasts that are baked into every country that's making pledges, they're dominated by wind, solar, and batteries. So the forecast energy supply for the world are not hydrogen and hydro dams and nuclear power. 75% of all the net energy uh, supply growth that is forecast to come in the energy transition is anchored in more wind and more solar with batteries to mediate it. That's it's a it's basically a wind solar story. It's not a hydrogen story. It's not a nuclear story. That's where the money is. It's where the subsidies are. It's where the aspirations are. But set aside the source of energy, just in terms of asking a question: Is it reasonable to expect this time that we could achieve a, an acceleration like the previous forecast? So to get the net zero to have 100% of the world's energy to come from non-hydrocarbons by 2050, not the 2040s and 2030s, but 2050, 30 years out. Uh, you could look at this as a construction issue because all energy machines have to be built. Doesn't matter whether you're building gas turbines or wind turbines, you know, solar arrays or you know, coal plants. It, make, it makes no difference. Everything involves steel, glass, metals, and construction equipment and backhoes and welding, and you have to build stuff. 
you have to build a lot of things. So what you'd want to know is whether or not it's reasonable to expect this level of construction were even possible from where we are today to say 2050. To calibrate that in terms of the construction demands, the physical demands on the construction industry, uh, think of this in this way, to go from where we are today to get to 100% non-carbon non energy, if we did it with windmills as a way to get a framing for the magnitude of construction required, you'd have to build a you have to build and install a thousand three megawatt windmills. The three megawatt ones are the size of the Washington Monument. So you need to build and install a thousand of those every day for thirty years. A thousand of them every day for thirty years, or put it put in broader terms, the you'd have to build and install every year a quantity of wind turbines that already exist globally. So all the all of the wind turbines that have been built over the last 20 years would have to build that much every year now for 30 years to get to this point. This is this is literally a warlike industrial expansion, that kind of that kind of construction program. Uh it's it's hard to say that it's actually totally impossible. I mean the, that's if one de devoted uh, the uh, sort of warlike levels, by, by warlike, I mean World War II levels of uh, industrial effort and focus on the construction program, it it's, may not be ad actually impossible. I just don't think it's possible in the sense that the world will will allocate uh, World War II levels of industrialization every year for 30 years just to building power plants to replace those that exist. But we're going to we're going to try. I mean, the U.S. has joined the spending tsunami. The Inflation Reduction Act, the Green New Deal. This is the uh, this is the Congressional Budget Office's forecast for where the spending is now going to go in the coming years. So it takes a little. It's going to take a little while to spool up spending that much money and get the construction going and the permits. But it's it's you know, significant money. We're going to be spending hundreds of billions of dollars a year every year uh, again if it's if it's allocated and deployed over the next decade. And the goal here, again. It's self-evident, but I'll state it. The goal here, of course, is that the installation of wind and solar instead of combustion machines is to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. So the graph on your right uh, is a forecast by the Energy Information Administration on, on the impact on U.S. carbon dioxide emissions from this spending. Their assumption is that if all the money is actually spent, both in the Inflation Reduction Act and, and in the Infrastructure Act, both are required, there's a... This graph doesn't show you the several hundred billion dollars of wind and solar spending and transmission spending in the Infrastructure Act. You add them both together, and it's something on the order of a trillion dollars of direct spending, and it looks like another half trillion dollars of indirect spending. See, Goldman Sachs just came out with an analysis to, to sort of confirm the magnitude of the mandated spending in markets through requiring businesses to do things that are not funded. And you do get, you know, you do get uh, an emissions reduction of about a gigaton. Uh, in the United States, that's the the maximum reduction case. That's if it all happens, which which matches incidentally the emissions reduction of the last twenty years. Uh, the last twenty years of U.S. emissions reductions that have occurred, the gigaton, about uh, eighty percent of that came from uh, low cost gas pushing coal out of the market. It was the fracking shale revolution that led to that most of that gigaton reduction, and they, they plotted, of course, the uh, em expected emissions from China. And the stated case, by the way, that they've shown here for China's emissions, don't include them actually building the coal plants they're building. China's building and installing, I think, a coal plant a week right now, and adding more carbon dioxide emissions to the world in the next five years than, than Britain has emitted since the Industrial Revolution. But that's so that that curve, if you model it based on what China's actually doing, would would go up past 12 gigatons. I mean, it, it's an important context in this sense that uh, in in the global negotiations, the climate and the climate treaties, uh, China has been given a, a pass, as you all know, on doing anything until after 2030 or 2040, depending on on the, the on the domain. And uh, we're going to spend uh, at least a trillion dollars to take a gigaton out if it all works out. And uh, buying a lot of stuff from China, by the way, and they they are going to add uh, far more than that each. Uh, over that period, just to, this is, of course doesn't count the uh, implications of the rest of Asia or Africa. I should note that the at the same time that we're doing this um, uh, attempt to reduce our emissions, we've also got 
Congress passing money and subsidies, the CHIPS Act and other reshoring and restoring of U.S. manufacturing. If you do the, do the math on this, given the nature of our energy economy, if we're successful, and, and I'm count me uh, uh, in favor of trying to restore and reshore U.S. manufacturing, but if we're successful in getting the U.S. back to its share of manufacturing that it enjoyed in the year 2000, just to that level, then the carbon emissions from that reshoring will uh, wipe out the gigaton of emissions that are eliminated by the trillion in spending on the electric grid. We have a we have um, we have a, an example of what we should expect to happen in the in the coming decade or two from our spending in Europe because Europe's been doing has already been doing what we're starting to do. They've already they've already built a lot more windmills and solar arrays as as you doubtless know. And right now, what Europe has been doing for the last year, it's been the news a lot. It's been it's been trying to accelerate that. It's been trying to accelerate its its uh, reduction in, in in oil and gas use, but. Uh, is you know it's clearly what they're doing is trying to stop using uh, or avoid using or do without because it was it was not shipped to them Russian oil and gas. So put put in sort of broad not not put geopolitical terms or warlike terms, but just put in sort of cal terms to calibrate what Europe's trying to do is they're trying to uh, replace about five percent of the world's oil and gas. That's the share the, their their share of energy dependency on Russia for oil and gas is roughly equal to that those nations collectively spending enough money to eliminate 5% of the world's oil and gas. Not 100% of the world's oil and gas, not all of their oil and gas, but 5% of the world's oil and gas. And what would be in, what's interesting to look at is what they've actually done in the last uh, 12 months. Uh, the graph on the right is the uh, total European um, wind turbine orders. Uh, from 2014 through the end of 2022. Uh, 2021 had a, a pretty significant increase in wind turbine orders, and they fell off the cliff. And this doesn't show the last two quarters. It went it went to zero uh, wind turbine orders for Europe, uh, but in the last quarter of, uh, of 2022. So in the middle of a crisis to replace oil and gas, in this case, not for climate reasons, but because of Russia, uh, wind turbine orders went away. They just fell off a cliff. Uh, so you'd have to ask yourself, what did they do instead? And also, why did the wind turbine orders fall off a cliff? I'll get to the why in a minute. One of the reasons why is that they wouldn't make a significant difference quickly enough. What they've done instead is, is something that they said they weren't going to do as early as a year ago, which is build lots of LNG terminals. So for, for, the, for a quick reaction, they built what are called floating LNG terminals, floating regasification re 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 units, about 20 of them. They cost about $15 billion up, up and down the entire European coast. To, to replace the energy value to their economies in capital terms with wind turbines would have required spending about $200 billion in wind turbines. And they'd still need the LNG and natural gas to keep the lights on when the wind's not blowing because batteries are not a substitute. I give you a sense of the magnitude of why they're not a substitute. If you think just in energy storage terms, one LNG tanker holds as much energy as 4 million Tesla batteries. It's a, it's a very big problem to store energy at continent-wide scales, and it's not done with batteries, and it won't be done with batteries for a very, very long time. So what Europe has actually done as a practical matter is buy more gas from America where our LNG stopped going to Asia, and they went to Europe instead. And the Russian gas and oil went to Eurasia instead of ours. There was just sort of realignment of uh, global oil markets and gas markets. And it didn't result in a reduction in global oil and gas use. It resulted in a realignment of who ships what to who and who buys from whom. But to drill down a, a, a level into what Germany has done as, as a role model for us in America, which what we're trying to do is to emulate Germany's the scale of German uh, wind and solar to displace, uh, in their case, both hydrocarbons and nuclear power because they swore off nukes, as you know. So what, what's happened in Germany, we're going to emulate. So let's look what Germany did in the last two decades. As they, as, they, as they spent money, they were spending money principally on the electric grid. As they spent money to expand their grid, they were expanding their grid at a time when the actual increased demand for electricity over that time period was about 10%. So from 2000 to 2022, 
Total consumption of electricity in Germany went up about 10%, not a lot. They're a pretty efficient economy and they didn't, you know, they grew and they became more efficient. But bottom line is the call on electricity from the grid went up only 10%. But what they did over that two decades is they basically doubled the size of their electric grid. They left about 80% of the original grid in place. This is what this is, uh, this is Germany EU data. They, they left most of the original grid in place except for the nuclear power plants. And they layered on top of that, lots of capital spending on wind and, and solar. So this had an effect. It had the effect of underutilizing the conventional assets, which made them more expensive. It had the effect of increasing the cost of electricity in Germany by over 200%. And it had the effect of making the German energy system more fragile, that is operationally more fragile, which is why, uh, and economically more fragile, which is why when you, when you have uh, exogenous events like uh, wind lulls, which means you have to call on gas and spot markets or a war in Ukraine, which push you into gas on spot markets. The share of your electricity that's being produced by gas or coal uh, doesn't change dramatically. What happens is the cost of the fuels changes dramatically. It has an outside, outsized effect on the economy, which is exactly what's happened. So the United States is essentially on this path. We're not, no, no one is proposing to shut down all the coal, gas, and oil plants. There will be some more coal plants shut down. When I say no one, obviously there are people calling for that. But those aren't the policy plans in, in, the, in the utility sectors. They're to phase them out over time, slowly, but to add a lot of wind and solar in the meantime. The effect of that will be to raise electricity costs. If you remember my first graph about what are the most important accomplishments in all of human history is drive the cost of electricity and energy down, energy particularly broadly. So in Europe, uh, this is again, EU data, uh, looking back uh, over the last 20 years, if we look and said, Instead of uh, look at this as a timeline, look at it in terms of the increased share of wind and solar as a, as a capacity per capita. So this normalizes away from small and large country, countries. You're looking at how much wind and solar capacity are on grids in each country as a share per capita. And then you look at the residential electric rates in those countries. And you find there's a very strong correlation as you increase the share of wind and solar, the cost of electricity goes up. It's roughly... One to one, you double, you, you know, you get doubled electricity prices as you increase the share by, you know, roughly three x. Think about this for a second. The wind and solar arrays are being subsidized, so that the subsidy costs are not shown up in electric rates. The subsidy costs are shown up in taxes. So the taxes pay for artificially creating lower cost capital to go into electric grids. Yet despite that, the absolute cost of electricity for the real cost of electricity for residential consumers kept rising. You'd have to ask why, because the narrative is that wind and solar are cheaper. Turns out that, yes, it is true that when the wind turbine is operating and solar array is operating, at that spontaneous moment in time, it's producing cheaper electricity. It doesn't result in cheaper electricity on grids because of what's needed to be done to keep the lights on. The activities to keep the lights on result in higher costs. It means electric rates go up. We can see the same phenomena on a micro scale in the United States in Excel service territory, which they have about 4 million customers. This is data from their rate case. And we, 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 the y-axis shows that the annual average electric bill for the average residents in Excel service territory. It was about 900 a year, uh, 15 years ago. And now what they've done on your y-axis is increase their use of wind and solar on their grid. And the dotted lines are their forecasts that they submitted to their utility commission on where electric rates are going to go. So what you have is you, you go from 5% of share of wind and solar to um, a little over a third. And that's resulted in a 200% increase in the cost of residential electricity in that service territory. This, is, uh, this correlation, by the way, is visible in every state and every country in the world where you increase the share of energy from wind and solar on electric grids. So that's the money side. L let me let me switch uh, to the practical problem, the sort of the elephant in the room, the problem that's hidden in plain sight, if you like, is the minerals problem, which I've written and talked a, a lot about. This is this is back to the construction issue. Uh, wind turbines and solar arrays are not renewable. They're the energies. The, the idea of a renewable energy is a bit of a misnomer. In fact, it's a complete misnomer. All energy machines, all energy systems require building machines. 
all machines wear out. It doesn't matter whether the machine is tapping free oil and gas. Oil doesn't have an inherent cost. It exists in nature. The costs in getting oil out of the ground are machine costs. The cost of, of deli delivering oil in a useful form are machine costs. The same is true for the wind and the sun. The renewability feature is interesting, but it's actually a it's actually a bug, not a feature, if you like, which we'll we'll get to. What really what really matters, what you really want to know, uh, are two things. One of them is the overall cost, which I'll come back to, and the other is that the the direct and real material requirements to build the machines. And we do know a lot about that. This is IEA data. And there's, I'm showing this here, bundling all the metals and minerals into two categories, copper and all the others. All the others are things like manganese and zinc, aluminum, obviously lithium, uh, and you know cobalt in some cases, but it's not, not a, it's not a big factor. Uh, nickel is a big deal, steel. So to build uh, an electric vehicle, for example, on your far right, compared to co building a conventional vehicle, you need about 500% increase in the metals and minerals produced and used to build the vehicle. Uh, the biggest increase is in copper. You need 300% more copper uh, typically to build an electric vehicle rather than a conventional vehicle. If you compare solar photovoltaics and wind, wind farms, whether onshore and offshore, the combustion turbines, gas turbines, what you find is that the total call on metals to deliver the same unit of power uh, is roughly a thousand percent higher. Could be a lot higher if you go offshore. Now this is so per car. Does it doesn't anything about how you use the car? But that's per car, uh, and it's per wind turbine, if you like. Now in the car's case, we, we'll, I'll come back to that later in terms of what the implications are for emissions. And but in the energy production case, wind and solar, uh, this understates the minerals requirements because this is per unit of power. It, it is beyond obvious that this is counting not watt hours, but watts. And that means that to, to look at the actual increase of metals demands, you have to look at the quantity of machines you have to build to deliver the same total energy to society. In other words, you have to build extra machines to provide power when the sun's not shining, the wind's not blowing, to store energy for when it's not. So roughly speaking, you triple this. So you go to instead of a thousand percent increase in metals required per unit of power, you get about a 3000 percent increase in total metals required per unit of energy delivered to society to heat a room, to, to keep a computer running, to you know make steel, whatever. This is this leads to uh, and, I, and and I'm using IEA data by large. There are other other data sets for this. This leads to um, estimates of the increased demand for metals like lithium, minerals like graphite, and metals like nickel. Increase in demand compared to wh where we are today to meet the energy transition aspirations. Are, are astonishing numbers. It's you know not 19%. This is 19-fold increase in demand for nickel. That's 2,000% more nickel needs needed than we're now using. You need 4,000% more lithium than we're, we're now using. And when you look at these these demands, the, this magnitude of demand increase over the next two decades is the lar the largest increase in demands for these metals and minerals has ever occurred in human history. They're they're the, the sheer demand to meet the metals needed to build machines, the windmills, batteries, and solar arrays, exceeds, uh, in every case except for copper, the known reserves, not, not the mines. I'm talking about the, ge the geologically known reserves, not the geophysical resources in the Earth's crust. That's sort of irrelevant. That's functionally infinite. What matters is the reserves, where we know the metals exist, that we can actually access them and build mines. So we actually have demands coming except for copper, that are greater than known reserves. We also have demands greater than the mines that are supplying. The IEAS said that the world's going to have to build hundreds of new mines, not a few, to meet the metals demands for the energy transition over the next two decades. They've also pointed out the average time to, to qualify and build a new mine is 16 years globally. So, I mean, beyond obviously... If you don't start opening the mines today, the metals aren't going to be available to the year 20, uh, you know, mid mid 2030s. And yet we have metals demands that are going to start escalating in the next year or two, long before these mines could be built. This graph on your left is, is data showing the demand for copper to meet the expectation for electric vehicles. And the blue lines are, the dark blue line is the current global production of copper for all purposes. And the light blue line is the production if all the 
plans that are now in place for copper mines are actually uh, put into place. The right graph shows you global plans on capital spending by all the world's mining industries. What, what's remarkable about this is that in the face of uh, the awareness that the metals demands for the energy transition are off the chart enormous, that the actual capital expenditures that have been in, put in place to expand mining have been declining for the last uh, six or eight years and are based on announced plans are still in decline. The uh, blue hash bar is the capital investment required at Global Mines that's needed to meet the metals needed by the year 2030. That's not what's actually happening. The world is, to say the world's miners are underinvesting and the mining capacity to meet the needs would be a profound understatement. I'm not going to spend any time on this point except to make the point just once. Uh, you'd ask, one would also ask where the mines are today that are supplying these energy minerals, energy minerals meaning the copper, nickel, rare earths, lithium that are needed to build energy machines. The mining is not in America by and large. The marginal mining won't be in America. Uh, but what's much more important and where the mining itself is, is where the refining is, the chemical processing needed to turn the metals and minerals into a form useful to make batteries, windmills, and solar arrays. There, it's an overwhelmingly a Chinese story, which has gotten a lot of news lately for a whole, whole variety of reasons. Now, China made the announcement 10 years ago and 20 years ago that this was their plan to become a global powerhouse in minerals and metals refining, and they have. Uh, China has uh, a market share in energy minerals that's roughly double OPEC's market share in oil, just as a geopolitical calibration. So let me turn, instead of geopolitics, just a practical question and turn it off of windmills and solar arrays to electric vehicles, to, to EVs, to cars, to Teslas, uh, in large measure because that's sort of the epicenter of, of excitement about uh, cutting carbon dioxide emissions. And uh, the excitement is reflected, of course, not just in um, uh, the impressive company that Elon Musk has built, but the fact that a dozen states and I think about four dozen countries have announced outright bans on the sale of internal combustion engines by 2030 or 2035. So this is a graph from Volkswagen's study they have online. Volvo has a similar one. I picked theirs. There are plenty. There are plenty of data like this in the technical literature, but theirs was particularly good and very and very honest. What they did is, is uh, answer the question of whether or not electric vehicles zero emissions. Obviously, it's not. Uh, it, it, everyone knows you have to charge the, the the batteries with power plants. What kind of power plants you use dictate the emissions the vehicle actually has. That that. Those emissions are determined by where you are in the world and what time you charge the vehicle. Depends on where you are, the vehicle could be charged with all wind, it could be charged with all coal, just depends on where you are in the world and when you charge the vehicle. And, and that's a very important factor, but the factor that's really, in legal terms, the, the, most, the dispositive one is the emissions associated with manufacturing the batteries in the first place. It takes about 250 tons of materials to be mined from the earth to get the minerals to manufacture a single EV battery. And that mining entails about 15 barrels of oil equivalent of energy just to dig up that much material to make one battery. Doesn't sound like a lot, uh, except that those, those barrels are not all oil, a lot of it's coal. Uh, and it may be 30 barrels of oil equivalent in some jurisdictions, it might be 10 in other jurisdictions. We actually don't know exactly what it is and no automaker knows exactly what it is because they don't really know that much about the supply chain. But we do know what the range is. We know the range is somewhere between 100 tons and 500 tons of materials have to be extracted to make an EV battery. And we know somewhere between 10 and 30 barrels of oil uh, equivalent of energy have to be consumed upstream to manufacture an EV battery. What that means is it can be translated into carbon dioxide terms, which is what Volkswagen did. So the pre-production phase of the uh, phase of the vehicle, before you drive it at mile zero, when you're conventional, this is a diesel uh, Volkswagen uh, Golf, be before it arrives in your driveway, it's emitted five tons of CO2 just to manufacture it. Before the electric vehicle, the electric version of that Golf arrives on your driveway, it's emitted in this model 12 tons of CO2. So obviously over time, the EV emits additional carbon dioxide. This is modeled on the European grid. And the diesel one at some point actually emits more CO2 than the electric vehicle. I mean, look, at, look what you're seeing here. It's not till you've driven more than 60,000 miles in Europe that your electric vehicle has emitted less CO2 than 
the diesel vehicle has. This, this illustration is extremely sensitive to, to the materials that are used to make the battery. So the Volkswagen model here of 12 tons of CO2 to make that battery is for a small battery. It's for a 40 kilowatt hour battery. For a Tesla battery, it would be 24 tons of CO2 emitted to make the battery. So if you can imagine what that tells you is the obvious, that in that particular model, it means that the electric vehicle never emits less CO2 than driving the diesel. That, is that always going to be the case? No, uh, but it, can it be frequently be the case? Obviously, it, we know it can be. The, uh, the problem we're having right now with the narrative about uh, pushing hard with electric vehicles to reduce emissions is we actually don't know how much emissions they'll reduce. We do, we do know that on average, in many places, they will have some reduction, maybe like this model here, a 20%, a 10 to 20% reduction in CO2 emissions. In many cases, it could be an increase in CO2 emissions. And the, the in, CO2 emissions in the future will actually grow faster than current models have built into them because the ore grades, let me just, an ore grade is the quantity of copper that's in the rock you dig up. The ore grades are declining and have been, have been declining for essentially all of human history, but let's just look at the last, we'll just look at the last century. The average ore grade of copper, this is true for all metals, has been in continual decline, but the episodic points of really interesting discoveries like occurred in the 1930s in Chile. But what you have is a continual decline in ore grade, and the forecast for that is the continual decline in ore grade. Declining ore grade just means you have to dig up more rock and process more rock to get material. Instead of digging up a ton of rock to get a pound of material, you have to dig up two tons of rock to get a pound of material. The energy cost per ton of copper is highly sensitive to ore grade. This, this should be obvious, but what's, what's not well understood and widely known, it's not linear. So this graph on your right shows you the uh, increased energy consumption per ton of copper on the y-axis as the ore grade de declines on the y-axis going left. As you can see, these are all the, um, the triangles are, are, um, are plot points for, for copper mines in the world because there are old copper mines that have high ore grades and are new, uh, the newer copper mines have lower ore grades. You can see it's nonlinear. As we push as we push the lower and lower ore grades, you're going to get a nonlinear increase in energy used to get a ton of copper. I want to remind you, every electric vehicle is 300% more copper. The call on copper is going to be two to 300% more than the world is now planning to mine. Chasing more copper mines, never mind where they are, means digging up more rock at lower ore grades, which means the actual emissions of CO2 for the copper to make the electric vehicles will be rising non-linearly in the future. This is not built into any of the models that are being uh, put out for the reductions of CO2 emissions associated with subsidies and mandates around the world. When I show that kind of data, well, maybe in your mind, what most people say is, well, oh, well, the technology will get better. Because if you make an, a, a car battery, energy, if it's, it's energy density twice as good, you reduce the weight of the materials you need by twofold, obviously. That's just very simple. Better, better battery chemistry leads to higher energy densities, leads to fewer materials per battery. It cuts down the demand on metals, beyond obvious. All technologies get better, but battery technology is not getting better at a Moore's law exponential rate, which you hear stated a lot. And there's no nothing in the physics of the universe we live in that can close the gap between the energy density of oil and the energy density of ba lithium batteries. The, the graph on your left is in watt hours per kilogram. Uh, Tesla batteries as deployed are in the 200 watt hour per kilogram range. You could imagine seeing that double. It's not. It's not unrealistic to think that, that that will happen in the coming decade or two, but it's also equally obvious that doubling it doesn't come anywhere close to closing the gap with oil, which is the essential problem that electric cars have, and especially electric airplanes competing with, competing with oil. The, gar the, the graph on your right, the blue dots are actual as sold lithium ion batteries brought into the market from 1990 through 2022. And instead of y-axis and watt hours per kilogram, this is a, a y-axis is showing you the weight of the battery as compared to the weight of gasoline plus an internal combustion engine. But differently, the moder a modern battery provides energy 
that is only 5% of the energy of an internal combustion engine plus its gas tank. 5%. It's, or put differently, it's 20-fold higher energy density or worse, worse energy density, 20-fold, not 20%, than an internal combustion engine with gasoline. The important point is that the batteries are good enough to make useful electric cars. Obviously, they are, because in 2007, when I think it was 2009, sorry, when Elon Musk introduced the sedan uh, Model S, uh, you could see on the graph, he did that right at the inflection point where lithium ion batteries, uh, energy density had improved uh, two and a half fold in a period of 30 years. And that led to the EV craze. Well, you'll see that that energy density is sort of tilting down and off in the last two or three years. You might ask what's going on. The answer is the avoidance of use of cobalt, which has a whole set of other issues, which is a very energetic uh, metal. It makes for high energy density batteries still used exclusively in smartphones and laptops. But the avoidance of use of cobalt, uh, partly because of price, but more because of supply chain ethics in the uh, into Congo, uh, the switching to other classes of chemistry, lithium iron phosphates and nickel classes, reduces the energy density of the batteries, which, which means you need more materials to produce the uh, same mileage, the same range for an electric vehicle. The battery technology and will get better, so will windmills, solar, solar arrays, but they're not getting better at an exponential rate anymore. The narrative that's put out that this 90% drop, this exponential decline in the cost of these new energy transition technologies is true. But it's not true that the, the, the exponential change is continuing. It's a leveling off. You get to, you get to, you get to um, uh, asymptotic improvements in technologies as they mature and wind, solar, and batteries, and electric cars are no different. What you also get to is a point to where the overhead costs, the other features of the technologies uh, are less and less expensive. Labor costs go down, manufacturing costs go down. But what doesn't change is that you still need materials. In fact, what's happened now is we've gotten so good at producing batteries and solar arrays and wind turbines that the raw material costs now, now come to dominate the cost to make the devices. So while 70% of the cost to make a lithium battery now is just in the purchase of the metals and materials. And that's true for uh, solar arrays as well. About 20 to 30% of the cost of a wind turbine is just the cost of the materials, the steel and the adymium, the uh, uh, concrete, and the, and all, all the raw materials that go into making it. What that's meant is that the decline in cost of these machines in the last five years slowed and reversed. Now, the revert, this is this is the published data on the delivered costs of wind, solar, and battery machines in the last uh, half dozen years, normalized to where you know, 2017 is 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 a hundred percent or one or one hundred. So what you'd have to ask is, will that continue or will it reverse? Will we go back to a decline? The answer to that is entirely tied up in whether or not mineral costs go up or down. Because again, 70% of the cost of lithium batteries and the minerals, what you'd wanna know is, will minerals costs get cheaper or more expensive in the future? Because that will determine the future costs of the transition machines. Okay, well, let me uh, let me wrap up with just one last point. Um, so the, the last point is sort of derivative from that graph I showed you. You might imagine what I'm gonna say. The energy cost of the of the energy trans the economic cost of the energy transition is rising and not shrinking. Subsidies can't hide that; they can just move money around. The subsidies will have to be bigger. Whether it continues to rise or not will be dependent entirely on whether the world's miners mine enough materials. They're not showing evidence of a willingness to do that. I think they probably don't, but we'll, we'll find out. Uh, at the moment, they're not. So what we have is an aspiration, which this graph represents, that the world will slow its increased consumption of energy, which has never happened going into the year 2050. That is, the population will grow, economies will grow, but absolute consumption of energy will slow and stop. Again, this has never happened. The assumption that that will happen and that we can afford to expand the share of renewables at a rate that's double to triple what we're now doing, which is what this model is. This is, a, this is a World Bank model. So the assumption that we could more than double or triple the growth rate in spending on renewables gets you the blue zone, which would cause the share of hydrocarbons to shrink. That's the aspirational model. This begs the question, beyond obvious, 
who supplies and at what price the hydrocarbon portion, because it's still two thirds of world's energy in 2050. And that that might be the most important single economic and geopolitical question of our era, which is not being asked. And it's not being asked, well, it's, it's being asked in certain certain circles. It's certainly not being asked as a matter of government systemic planning. And it's a, it's a critical question to ask because the world is not going to abandon hydrocarbons in the future. In fact, President Biden said as much, I think, in what some people thought was a, a, a rhetorical slip. But then the Secretary of Energy, Granholm, has gone around the country since his State of the Union address when he said we're going to need oil and gas for you know at least 10 years, giving a speech pointing that out that truth. We're going to need a lot of it for a long time. The at least 10 years is an understatement. Um, if you get the aspirational forecast I'm showing here to actually happen, it's more than at least 10 years. It's many decades that we we'll need very significant quantities of hydrocarbons. And since the world doesn't like coal, even though it's burning more coal, this if you if you broke this graph out in, in terms of coal, oil, and gas terms, you actually see no diminution of any significance in world demand for oil going out 20 years, which is a problem because we're underinvesting in oil exploration and development globally right now, which will lead collaterally to the systemic, systemic risk of elevated energy prices happening at, at levels that could be unprecedented, both in terms of height and duration, uh, which I, I, I think I'll end with this point. I mean, I think that is that is probably the biggest um, systemic economic risk facing uh, the Western economies that is being under under analyzed and underappreciated right now. So I'll stop there. I, I went more than a half an hour. I, we think we have time for plenty of disputation and q and I'm happy to take any, any uh, questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mark. This is incredible. Tour de force. <laughs> Um, anybody wants to start off asking a question? Whom do we have? Tom Palmer. Thank you. Um, stimulating and informative and depressing. Um, <laughs> what about what about geothermal? I, I, I didn't hear much about geothermal, and it seems to me that like nuclear is under discussed and yeah. and uh, planned on. I mean, he, heat pumps are half of the heat pumps, I think, are geothermal. The other half are a different kind. But go ahead. Right. Yeah. Well, there's lots of ways to produce energy uh, in in a in a sense. There's geothermal, and there's lots of discussions. If you know, not just about nukes, but also about trying to find clever ways to get the hydrogen and biodiesel. My, my point first was that that's not where the money is going. Um, so seventy again, more than seventy, maybe eighty percent of all the money is being directed at windmills, solar arrays, and batteries, lithium batteries. That's where the money is going. Uh, the reason it's not going to geothermal is that while heat pumps have significant efficacy, there's no question, they are they are more expensive in capital terms. Capital always matters in markets. So any, any solution that involves <clears throat> higher capital up front, you know, for life cycle benefits, it, it, I, you know, I'm a fan of that approach up to a point because the up to a point is time value of money enters into the equation. That's that's non-trivial with nuclear, the solar, frankly, and wind. Uh, and geothermal. But what's more important is that the heat pumps are a tiny share. If you deploy heat pumps at scale that the world could use for residential and building heating, yeah, it, you know, it, it cuts energy demand. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't change the picture. Uh, it, it, it moderates the rate of increase mo modestly. If you add in the aspirations for deep geothermal, the real hot geothermal for electric production, that's extraordinarily expensive. These are very toxic environments, very difficult to keep machines running in those high, high temperature, uh, high, high chemical burden environments. Uh, they, it has, it's always been um, an aspiration in certain quarters to push geothermal, but even the most optimistic forecasts get you to you know, a trivial percentage of the world's energy coming from geothermal looking out 20 or 30 years. You can't, you can't get numbers over a few percentage points. Same is true, by the way, for hydrogen. Even the most optimistic forecasts today for hydrogen, the most wildly optimistic forecasts, get you to 5% of the world's energy from hydrogen and being delivered at about 300% higher cost per BTU than natural gas. I mean, that's at the wildest thing of the optimists. Though I didn't talk about that because that's not what's on, on, on tap. Nukes are, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a nuclear bull, frankly. I think of the three dozen different new reactor designs that are in the pipeline, all of them will work. All of them will work. 
And I'll bet you, I bet you 10 of them are economically viable and will, will get built. But again, you know, it'll take a decade to spool that up, another decade to begin to have the infrastructure. We're two decades out before we have significant penetration from nuclear electricity. And even if you got half of all the world's electricity from nukes, let's just take that as a goal, that's 10% of world energy. So you don't change the hydrocarbon picture very much. That's the, in fact, if I were, I would certainly, uh, if I'm making a, a, a political argument, I would argue for much more money in geothermal and heat pumps, nuclear energy, those domains than for wind and solar, because they, they will have far greater long run value economically, far, far greater positive impact from a climate perspective and carbonist perspective and far lower footprint impact. By footprint, I mean the real environmental impacts that come from expansion of uh, metals mining. So I, that's a long answer to, it won't make a difference. That's why, <laughs> sorry. David Epstein. Uh, I wonder if you'd be willing to speculate on the longer term trajectory that you think grows out of this. I mean, it seems like at the moment you have rich countries spending a lot of money trying to accelerate a transition, poor countries not doing that yet. Will the rich countries decide this is really too expensive or that it doesn't help anyway because the poor countries aren't joining? Will there eventually be a slow transition for everybody kind of driven by uh, yeah. slow change in technology or the slow depletion of fossil fuels? I mean, what's, what's sort of the long-term outlook? Yeah, well, Long term is easier to forecast than short term, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it's like the it's a <laughs> so the the, the the two buckets, the what's going to really happen and, and the rich country, the transition, what's really going to happen in energy markets, and and then the rich country, poor country problem, if you like. So I don't think the rich countries, I mean, I, I say this in a in a I don't mean to be facetious, I don't think they really care. Uh, what happens to the poor countries? If they did, they wouldn't be doing this because it's, it's it's economically damaging to those 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 nations. They don't have any path to getting to even a fraction of our level of wealth and comfort without using lots of hydrocarbons that are cheap. They just don't, and it's borderline immoral. But I don't think anybody really cares. That if I, and there are people who do, but I don't think anybody really cares. I think the only thing that stops uh, overspending on on energy technologies that underperform will be when the economic consequence is serious enough that the Western nations stop it. And I think a bit of that is what, well, a bit, a lot of that's what's happening in Europe right now. So if you look at what's actually happened in the last year to avoid a calamity from a reduction of gas and oil availability from, from Russia, they've done essentially two things that are not repeatable. So this winter is a real big problem for Europe. The first is they did fuel switching so that every industrial boiler that burned natural gas switched to oil all over Europe. And that's a very significant quantity, by the way, it's, it's also for gas turbine power plants, gas turbines that can burn oil. There's a lot of dual fuel plants here and there. Those switch from gas to oil because in, in BTU terms, as expensive as oil is, it was a third of the cost of natural gas for Europe. So that was a one time deal. You can't do it twice. I mean, the, the switching happened. They uh, th throttled back industries, as you know, the industri industrial sector throttled, uh, but the industry throttled, the, the big throttling occurred in the big energy consuming industries, chemicals, fertilizer, and steel. So they throttled down. They, they, if they throttle down the next notch, they shut down because there's these machines can't uh, be run up and down like a car. You know, steel, steel and glass melting uh, can't be turned on and off. When you turn them off, it, it basically is, a shutdown, not to, no, for a non-restart. They, the furnaces run for thirty years and then they're then they're rebuilt. They don't they don't turn them on and off. You can cycle them only a little bit. So what they really did was uh, was austerity in the in the sense fuel switching and source switching. They switched to our gas. We we can't ship them any more natural gas than we are now because we have to build more LNG terminals, more gas pipes domestically, and drill more. So they. They basically took our gas exports that went to Asia and they went to, went to Europe. Those are all one-time deals. So what they're what they're now doing is they publicly professed an increase in wind and solar goals. They have and they and they will they and they're going to expedite permitting for all that and they'll do that. 
but it won't make a significant difference. They've put out a, a roadmap, and what you'll see in their roadmap is that the two biggest impacts for keeping Germany and Europe lit and functioning as an economy, not going into energy-driven recession and depression, are oil and gas from other places, Africa, uh, you know, and uh, other parts of Asia and offshore, not from us, we can't increase it fast enough, and uh, more and more conservation slash deprivation mandates to use less and pay people to use less. So they, they in other words, maybe 20% of the future of Europe is in more wind and solar, and the rest is in more oil and gas. So if I were, I'm answering your the question in a long way by saying the future 20 years from now, as a share of world's energy, oil and gas will shrink. I have no doubt about it. It's a share, it will do, it has been shrinking. It went down two percentage points in the last 20 years, but the absolute consumption went up. So the pattern of the last 20 years will, will be repeated. The long term is, more wind and solar. If I were guessing how much more, I would say 200%, two to three times more. We're, we're gonna, the world is building lots of it now and it will keep building it and, and should build more. Let's just stipulate. Uh, I think it should subsidize it less, but should build more. So that will happen. That, that's baked in and will happen, but that won't eliminate more oil and gas and coal being used. So we're gonna see is that pie I showed from 1990 to 2020. 2020, 2050, we'll look like that with the red getting wider, wind and solar. There'll be some more geothermal, there'll be more nuclear over that long time period. I think nuclear gets a resurgence. So we will have, I wanna repeat the, the claim that we won't have a transition, we're gonna have an addition. The transition will be a, a change in the shares of energy that come from each source, but the absolute, ter absolute quantities, they all go up. I mean, that's what what that's what's happened, and there's nothing in the physics of energy that suggests that's not what's going to happen. Other than global global depression, let me just stipulate: you you kill energy demand, but with a depression. Thank you. Harvey has a question. You answer global alarm with alarm of your own <laughs> at the remedies that are suggested or aspired to, or. Uh, climate uh, change or, or climate uh, change back toward the good. So um, I'm wondering um, um, what about this um, a climate alarmism? It's, it seems that the pessimism which they uh, set forth is a mask for the optimism that is contained in the remedies they offer. And another point is, uh, if you should just fall silent and uh, no longer sound an alarm of your own, uh, wouldn't people just discover uh, the, the reality when it comes upon them in the same way that the Europeans have learned realism from that uh, wonderful event, the invasion of Ukraine? Yeah. Well... So I, I didn't say anything about climate change except in the sense that it's the motive for the energy transition. And the, really, the whole point of my excursion into the fuel cycle realities of electric vehicles is that it's, it's uh, demonstrably the case that that's not a solution. So the, if the problem is CO2, that's not the solution. The same is true for windmills and solar arrays. So... What I try to, what I've been trying to work on and write about and point to, is not whether or not what what the quote solutions are to climate change. It's that what's being proposed isn't. First, the, we have to we have to be deal with the facts. It isn't. It's not a solution. And nor does it take us to a solution. And if one asks what are the solutions, they fall into two buckets, and nobody likes them. First, uh, patience. If we want radically different energy systems. They take a very long time to implement it at global scales. It requires far more patience, and money can't change that. And money is, is a precious resource. It's the limited resource. So squandering money on things that don't work actually is destructive because if we believe the models, and if you're in the camp that thinks that the weather that we've seen is a result of climate change, it doesn't make any difference. There is a middle ground for people who think it's an apocalypse and those 
who think that it's going slow. And it's that the middle ground is no matter what happens, no matter what you believe, increasing resilience to nature's insults, you know, the resilience uh, movement, if you like, the uh, capacity to keep, uh, to engineer systems that make humans' ability to survive not only weather insults, but the consequences of hotter or colder weather, you know, crop resistance. These are all net goods for humanity, no matter what, no matter what you believe about the climate models. So since capital is a precious resource, we're putting capital on things that we know affirmatively don't quote, solve the problem. It's a misallocation of capital away from resilience. The goal to have technologies that would be magically better than we have today, and I'm using Bill Gates' word for magically better, is not is not unreasonable. We, you know, physicists eventually come up with new physics. We don't have it yet. But what's unreasonable is, is to think that it's a cafeteria that I can pick and choose the the breakthroughs. They don't happen that way. And the problem is we're not allocating money to the domains that bring lead to the serendipity of breakthroughs. It's not a breakthrough to make more efficient wind turbine. I mean, it's just not. It's not. It's not a breakthrough. A better battery is not a breakthrough. Lithium batteries have physical chemistry limits that are baked into the atoms they're made from. So a room temperature superconductor would be a breakthrough, affordable one. Uh, it's not crazy to think that such a thing will, 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 will emerge, but we don't know where it'll emerge. We can't, we can't put a, we couldn't do a moonshot for superconductors and get what we want because it won't happen that way. So uh, I, I, we, we're misallocating capital. Uh, it, it, whether or not, whether whether w w without regard to what things about what should be, should have, we're misallocating capital to dealing with with resilience and adaptation, and we're misallocating capital in terms of getting new technologies. Thank you. Who's who's the main culprit for this? What you say is it <laughs> a large part the electorate? So I'm German, <laughs> and you know the German electorate is easily appeased by all this <laughs> activism, alarmism. People think you know we need to do stuff. <laughs> And so they, they feel that they're on top of this somehow. And yeah. these issues are extremely difficult to explain. They yeah. involve all sorts of a terrible trade-offs, awful necessities to confront. Is it a, a problem of democratic politics in a way? Well, yes, of course it is. And and it, I would just say the old, the old line that uh, Churchill used, that Thatcher used, that other political philosophers have used, yeah, democratic capitalism is, is, is messy, a problem, and makes lots of mistakes, except... The alternative is worse because we, we don't know the future and uh, policy by diktat, by dictators and by diktat uh, is really a bad outcome. So, uh, I, I, yes, people people want solutions. Policymakers want solutions. Citizens want solutions. I was just looking at some survey data to correlate what people profess they want versus their behaviors because the, the challenge in the climate debate is it is indisputably the case, indisputable. That whatever if whatever claims are made that the oil industry and big oil has suppressed people's belief in climate change is indisputably not true. It, it, every country that you do a survey in, and I've seen the surveys for all these countries, <laughs> including the United States, including among Republican millennials and Republican boomers, all all have accepted that a there's climate change and b we should do something. It, this is uh, depends on the poll and how you ask the question. It's from sixty to ninety percent. So. This is not in dispute, but what you look at consumer behaviors, this is why I showed you the trends for SUVs and houses and where people live. So the value of housing on coasts where you're gonna get swamped by Al Gore's rising oceans has, has gone up exponentially in the two decades of climate awareness. Okay, uh, apparently people are moving there and they don't really believe it, I, I guess. I mean, what, what you have to ask yourself, I'm not a psychologist, but the behaviors the behaviors are not reflecting the quote beliefs. And I think there is an innate understanding that if you tease it out is that people actually recognize it's not that easy. It's pretty expensive and they don't want to do the expensive things. They want somebody else to do it. And, and it, it's a pretty common failing of human nature. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to vote for uh, on either side of the aisle of what we believe for I don't, I, mandates to avoid using wind and solar, we're going to avoid too much wind and solar when the lights go up more frequently than people like and their rates go up, which is essentially what's trending. Reliability goes down, costs go up. People don't like that. They'll demand it to get fixed. The politicians go behind closed doors and they ask the engineers, what do I do? I'm sure behind closed doors in Germany, they, they said, 
can you build windmills and solar plants and batteries fast enough to get us off gas? What do we do? And their answer was build gas, build gas turbines. They told them that and you got to build them. What, and then they said, burn coal now, which is what they've done. Uh, because they, you, you, you're faced with that decision of no power or power or power at astronomical costs and rationed or doing that, they chose to do that. We're going to see more of that because the inertia in the systems don't allow the solutions they want to happen when they want. Not never, but not in the next 20 years. Thank you. Patrick Dowell. Uh, yes, I was, I was a little puzzled by the uh, chart you had on the uh, decrease in the uh, anticipated budgets for uh, mining companies. <laughs> yes. I would think with the with the imposing uh, demand, increase in demand for them, that they would be increasing those budgets. You'd uh, think, yeah. So, so what's the explanation for it? You're not the only one that's puzzled. <laughs> Fadi Byrall, the head of the IEA, has been on the soapbox, not puzzled, but alarmed, right? Ra raising the alarm bell at the mining industry. Well, I'll tell you my theory. Because that's a that 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 declining budgets is real. Now there are exceptions. There are a few companies that have increased their budgets. Uh, in fact, the Wall Street Journal and Financial Times both had articles recently about increased spending in the mining sector, and they cherry picked some some of the bigger miners that have increased their budgets. But they but they this when they disaggregated the budget increase, what they found was that about a third of the budget increase was allocated towards meeting ESG and related requirements, not the mining more. And about two thirds of it was allocated to buying other mining companies, smaller ones. Uh, you, you know why they're doing it, of course. But so, yeah, so why aren't why aren't they? If let's use copper, okay? Because copper is unavoidable. You can't you don't get the energy transition without more copper. Copper is not substitutable in all in almost every application except one, which is long distance transmission, where there is arbitrage with aluminum. But for everything else, it's not substitutable. There is no substitute. So it's a pure case. And we've been mining copper for longer than any metal. It's the first metal that was mined, we believe, in prehistory. We know lots about copper. And IHS Platts put out a study looking at the copper demands uh, last year and said the copper demands for the transition and the electric vehicles will be roughly two to three-fold greater than supply expected in the next decade. It's a big gap. Why aren't the miners mining more? Well, it, th the answer is in two numbers that are in every report and analysis on mining. The average time it takes to open a mine, 16 years globally, 10 and it's accelerated. Let's just say, let's use 10 for an accelerated ju jurisdiction. And the average cost to open a mine, right? 2 billion, 5 billion, 10 billion, depends on the mine. So imagine you're on the board, you're a fiduciary, and, the, and you've got a proposal from the mining engineers who love mining. I worked for a mining company in my youth in Canada. I like mining. I like miners. I've been to mines. They're great. And they said, we got, you know, look at this demand that's coming from the mandates just for electric cars. Um, you get started. So now what you're doing is you're allocating billions of dollars of capital uh, on the assumption that the market's going to need that. So this is my guess. They don't think the market's going to going to tolerate the price. So you have to have higher price to do this mining. So you have to first believe the prices stay elevated because the marginal costs are going up as the ore grades are going down. The marginal costs are going up as ESG requirements are arising, as labor requirements and environmental, all these things are adding to costs, but the big one is ore grade. So you would, you would have to take the, you, you're not taking this bet. Say, let's say you're three years in, it's the year 2025, 20, 26, copper prices are, gone through the roof, which they're going to. And um, that causes construction costs to go up, appliance costs to go up, windmill costs to go up, electric car, co everything that uses copper prices go up. Even though copper is only five to 10% of the cost of the bill of goods for those things, if copper is 300% more expensive, you have inflationary impact on all those commodities and goods. It, you're running the risk at the world at that point says, oh, you know what, we're going to slow down. So you're, you, you're here with an unfinished copper mine, you're $2 billion in, and the world decides it's gonna slow down. That, that will collapse the cost of copper. You'll be stuck not only with your operating copper mines operating below cost, you'll be stuck with $2 billion of capital deployed in a mine you can't finish. 
this is really high risk stuff to gamble the world's going to do this. It's essentially what if I'm if I run that board, I would vote against the, the capital expansion unless somebody guaranteed the capital. And there are there, so the EU is is nosing up to doing that, by the way. They're very worried about this. So the central banks are looking at preferred loans, guaranteed loans. I mean, they haven't done it yet. Uh, they've banned investment in oil and gas. We can't finance oil and gas exploration. And they are have preferences for metals exploration and metals mining on, on the continent of Europe. But they haven't been successful in really getting the sufficient commitments because the real, real risk is what I described. The world decides it's not going to do this in the end, halfway to your construction program. And if the whole world does that simultaneously, which is what they're calling on the world to do, basically accelerate mining expansion at historically unprecedented rates. This will call metals inflation. I didn't put up a graph. The IMF did an analysis. IMF economists looked at the price. We, we have a, a century of really good data on, on, on price elasticity is demand, with demand for metals, all metals. We know a lot about this stuff in economic circles. It's really, really robust economic data, but the macro and macro and micro level. So they modeled the price impact on the key metals, if the energy transition is imagined proceeds for the year 2030, basically the what they call the steps plan, the stated plan, and they and their conclusion, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll try to get the, I'm not exaggerating. It will lead to metals broadly, metal prices elevated to historically high levels for the unprecedented time period of up to a decade. So they're they're predicting if it happens. Um, a level of inflation in the commodities markets has never been experienced in a century. Metal commodities have been in a 1% average decline absent you know, volatility for a century until 2010, 2005. They've been trending up since because principally of the call on metals on these plans that have been implemented. But it's been trending up slowly with some volatility. You know, it's up a lot, like nickel, aluminum. Uh, you know, the, the more common metals are about 200% more expensive than they were six years ago. The really big price spike last year has already come off down, but it's still 200% higher than it was six years ago. 200% is a lot for a commodity to be up and stay up. And that's even before the demand really hits. So that's a long way of saying, it's a really important question because you you wonder, what it would what does it take to get the mining industry to do that? What does it take? Well, it it, it takes them to make the decision that the risk is low enough to make that kind of capital investment. And we're talking globally, hundreds of billions of dollars of CapEx has to be put to work in the mining sector. In addition to the refining sector, the, the miners typically are not refiners. Sometimes they're both. So you need tens to hundreds of billions of dollars of new refineries built, metal refineries somewhere. These are very, very hard to build in the Western world. I mean, we don't build refineries anymore. They're built in Asia and Africa, principally in China. Because they're, you know, they're chemically challenging. You have to dissolve the rock with sulfuric acid to get the metals out. You know, with kilotons of sulfuric acid. This is a really expensive process to handle in an environmentally, you know, safe way, and it's really difficult to do in jurisdictions like the United States and Europe. So it's it's by and large not happening. There's a little bit. There's a there's a new lithium refinery uh, that's under construction in Europe. There's one being built here. So there's evidence that there's some response, but it's pretty small. Andy, please. Thank you, Mark. Um, in your conversation with Bill Kay, uh, I think that was less than two months into the war, uh, you spoke a bit about how um, a transition, not the transition that is delusion, but um, how Western Europe's opportunities to um, change uh, the behaviors and decisions and so forth. Um, I wanted to ask you what has, if anything, surprised you in the intervening year, and also what you forecast for the next two, three, five years in terms of how the West overall 
and our adversaries, um, Russia and China, uh, how things will progress. Well, this uh, this is the uh, proverbial sixty four thousand dollar question, right? I mean, <laughs> not just what surprised me. I'll tell you what surprised me. But what will what will happen now? Because I, I do think there's been a dose and a really terrible, shocking dose of reality dealt to the world by what's going on in Ukraine, because the world is figuring out how challenging it is to realign energy supplies at scale, because no one's done it at this scale before. I mean, Russia is about 70% of the world's oil and 12% of the world's natural gas. It's a big producer, so it's a big deal. But first, what surprised me uh, was that the Germans, on early April 2022, said, we're going to build an LNG terminal. I mean, I sort of figured they probably would, but it surprised me they did. And you you probably know, I mean, a, a, a really big LNG terminal, not, they didn't borrow something from somebody. They built from ground zero, from scratch, from, from Greenfield, an LNG terminal and commissioned it by the 1st of December of that year. Eight months, a multi-billion dollar industrial facility from, from announcement to commissioning. I mean, and they, the energy minister and the chancellor stood around at the, uh, the uh, groundbreaking bragging about the prowess of German industry. And I say, amen. I mean, wow, that is, you know, even if permitting takes a long time and we have the same issue in America, but building, building in eight months, they got, they got a free pass on permitting, just build the damn thing. That was, that was an exhibition of velocity that was really quite remarkable, really, uh, and, uh, and underappreciated because they could do it again and again and again. In fact, if I were making a prediction, they will. And they won't just build one in Germany, another one in Germany, they'll build one in France, they'll build one in Portugal. The, I mean, this is what they're going to do uh, because th you can't get enough pipes from the gas that you want in the contiguous area of Europe to get gas into Europe. And they can't get off gas unless they burn more coal and they don't want to burn coal. So that that was surprising. Um, I'm trying to give any what a, it was a pleasant surprise that we had a mild winter because but for that, uh, Europe would have been in deep, deep trouble. Uh, the big problem now is next winter uh, in terms of the one-time things I've said. So we'll see how they get from here to there. Uh, what, I, think, I think how the Western world's going to respond now is uh, more of what's happened in Germany. And I, I think, I think we're, we're, we're seeing evidence, first of all, of a rail politique. Maybe a, there's a rail energy politique now going on. Not, not abandoning uh, EVs or abandoning wind and solar. It's not, that's not what real politics would be. I don't think you can. There's too much inertia in that. But adding in a realism that we're going to have to, in many places, burn clean coal. That's what India is doing, Asia is doing. But in, in Europe and the United States, we have to build more gas turbines, not fewer of them, more pipelines drilled. I think there's a realization, you know, that the, the, England got up to the point and they never cross the Rubicon of reanimating shale, the shale industry there. That's going to be hard, but I think they'll, they'll reanimate the North Sea. And that's already happening in you know, Norway. So what I think we're going to see is a two-step process. One is quietly dealing with reality as it is, which is more oil and gas, and then figuring out where to get it that's reliable, which will be OPEC's the first go-to because they have more surge capacity right now than anybody else, including us. So no one's going to like that as we migrate. So they're going to start thinking again. It'll take a couple of years to where else do I get the surge capacity? And I think we'll we'll finally see a resuscitation of, of nuclear energy. I think this the handwriting's on the wall. There's lots of people excited about it. There's a lot of political bipartisan uh, agreement that that's important. Uh, the anti-nuclear movement is uh, reanimating itself. You can, if, if you follow this stuff, you've already seen lots more about nuclear waste and safety. All that's going to come back uh, full, full blown. But I think it's going to have a harder time because I think people are are less afraid, but also more afraid of the alternative. And I think they also would, would believe a simple story that look, we're better at it now. 
our technologies are better, and they are. They're affirmatively better. So I think that will that will be different. Uh, so that's that's and that's a good. I mean, it's going to be good. That's why I'm the last optimist. I think <laughs> I'm not. I'm not the one that. If I were doing a political uh, trade, the trade isn't to say you have to give up on your ambitions on wind and solar. It's a silly trade. First of all, you need the stuff. I, I think we have to ramp back the subsidies. I think that's. I think it's economically destructive. But that's that's a detail. The political trade is what Europe is already doing. Is we need we need to stop this narrative that we're going to abandon oil and gas. Part of that will be. It'll be harder to kill the, but it's going to happen. The sort of feckless policies to ban internal combustion engines. This is this is not going to end well for the automakers or for politicians, because you you simply don't have the capacity to produce vehicles at scale at prices people can afford. Does that mean we won't have more EVs? I'm I'm just deep into a paper I'm writing on electric vehicles. I feel like I finally have to do a deep dive on EVs because I'm writing about cars for so long. I like cars. I was a mechanic when I was young. I raced motorcycles. I took engines apart. I took electric motors apart. I built control systems. I like I like all those flavors of things. But they also tell you what works and doesn't. And there's not there's not going to be, you know, we're not going to take over the world with electric cars. We just, just it, it, it can't happen. It's just, it's even harder to do than taking over the electric grid. So it won't happen. And I think that realization will also come. It's also happened. Look, Germany has already pushed back, as you probably saw, on the EU proposal to outright ban internal combustion engines in 2035, uh, because they've gone behind closed doors, in my opinion. I don't have any inside information. And talk to the auto industry and ask them the question. I mean, the battery, give or take, is $10,000 as the bill of materials to build an electric car. So the bill of materials to build an internal combustion engine, the and car, and car, the entire car, is about uh, fourteen thousand. The whole car is fourteen thousand. Just the battery is ten thousand. So if you add in the other stuff that's not battery, just never mind the labor. I'm just talking about the stuff you have to buy. So what they've what they've been asking is, is that battery going to get cheap? I mean, is that going to get half the price, tenth the price? And behind closed doors, outside of hand waving technology breakthrough, they're being told no, not for a long time. Uh, and, and they know they know price sensitivity. I mean, what the most important product that people buy in America and in Europe, in fact, the world, but let's say the Western world, the most expensive product every citizen buys who's not a, a multimillionaire, a billionaire, is a car. There's nothing comes close. It's the single biggest piece of, 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 of household budgets other than the house. T uh, tinkering of that is political. <laughs> political kryptonite and boy they're gonna it's gonna be a huge blowback on this very soon so i i think what we'll have is a uh, lot you know lots more evs but done more sensibly um the market's going to adopt a lot of them there's, there's a, lot, a lot of utility value for electric vehicles is a second vehicle for commuting a lot of benefits from that a lot of rich people can afford it america's full of rich people the number of three-car households has uh tripled in the last 20 years and we know from the data that most EVs are bought as a second or third car and driven half as much as the first car, uh, which, which of course means they're providing half the climate benefit claimed, obviously, uh, setting aside everything else I've shown you. So I, I think I think that's why I had that reset as my title. I think we're uh, both because of economic reasons, because we're in an inflationary period, everything that's being done in energy policy is inflationary. It's not reducing the costs of energy or food. I, it, political tolerance for inflation is very low. And as long as it's transitory, <laughs> you're okay. But when you fuel a commodity inflation, which is what these plans do, uh, it's not transitory. And I, I think that, that the, the new realization of what the real politic of Europe has shown, coming contemporaneous with an inflationary environment and with a interest rate, increase environment, which is, has to happen. We all know the reasons why. You put the three together, you have the perfect storm in the lexicon, which is which is true by what, it's, it, it, those analogies are relevant. Single forces often aren't enough to make these macro changes that have to happen in policy. So I think we'll see a shift in policy. Um, and I think that'll, in the three, to, the three to five year, we see it. Do we see it in three to five months? You know, I don't know. Another exogenous event, you will, uh, you know, this winter is really a cold winter and they have a wind lull in the North Sea at the same time. 
it's going to be really, really ugly for, for, for all of Europe. It'll just be catastrophic price increases in energy. That would be a trigger, a black swan trigger, but you don't need that because we've already seen the evidence of, you know, look what BASF announced, their CEO. They're, they're, they're ending, they're, they're rent, winding down European operations, the biggest chemical co company in Europe and the, one of the biggest in the world. And they're winding down European operations because of, quote, input costs. They aren't confident the energy costs are going to moderate and go down. So they're going to exit, they're going to exit Germany. This is a big deal. I mean, the huge share of Germany's economy is driven by their exports because they're they export in absolute terms roughly co-equal with America and China. I mean, it's a export powerhouse. And it's and as one of, as their uh, as their finance minister said about three months ago. They they have they have financed their industrial expansion on the back of cheap Russian gas. He didn't say on the backs of wind and solar. He said on the backs of cheap Russian gas, which is a, which is clearly the case. Thank you, Cal. Will you ask the last question? If you have, do you have more time, Mark, or are you? Okay? Yeah. Well, if you sure, I'm I'm Great. I'm Great. all yours. If you if you guys uh, this is in. These are the right questions. Uh, you may not like my answers, but they're the right questions. That's great. Cal, you need to unmute yourself. There we go. How's there that? we go. Um, I'm looking, thinking about efficiencies, you know, making, you know, gasoline engines more efficient. So instead of getting 35 miles a gallon, you get 45 or 50, which means smaller cars, not heavier, big <laughs> vehicle, yeah. but smaller, safe cars. So you move people cheaper per mile. The other thing is, um, and this goes back probably to the 80s and 90s, we're wondering why cities and universities were building parking garages rather than trying to invest in public transportation. You know, isn't it cheaper to move lots of people in a bus or a streetcar rather than investing in a building that doesn't have a classroom and, you know, is just housing a car for six or eight hours and yeah. then the people drive back? 30 miles. I mean, I've been lucky to work a 15 minute at a place 15 minutes away by walking for over 40 years yeah. and you know driving 20 or 30 miles to work. But that's that's why you're still here 40 years later. <laughs> and um so you know, I'm looking at how you can reduce yeah. usages. I mean, sure. I'm retired now. So I walk to the grocery store three times a week and carry groceries back rather than driving to a supermarket yeah. and you know filling up the back with four or five bags of groceries for the week. Um, so you know I see you know there's I see climate change as a really um, sort of a disaster maybe not for me but maybe not for my child yeah. but for my grandchildren their world may not be a place as easily to easy to live in and well, how and how do we proceed so on the last point I won't spend time on it again. This is my argument for adaptation of resilience and the technologies there, because let me quote Bill Gates again, in an interview I gave after the, the Davos meeting, specifically about climate change, energy. He said, he doesn't think we're going to get to quote net zero by 2050. And he said, he said many times the technologies don't exist, his words, to do that. He said, even if they did exist, and they don't, he said they don't. I'm saying they don't, but he said he's smarter because he's richer, but he said that they don't. That by 2050, if you achieve net zero, that has no, no significant impact on the climate change that will follow. None. Which we know, true, based on the models. So in that, I want to talk about the other two points, but in that, in that 
context. This makes adaptation and resilience all the more important. And because capital is the limited resource in societies, you have to think very hard about how you allocate capital. We're not allocating capital resilience and to adaptation. And it's not, it's not happening partly because the, the climate movement, I'll call it that, because there is, a, there is a climate industrial complex as well, views that as capitulation. And you won't capitulate. My view would be you don't have to capitulate. You just agree whatever's going to happen. I'll take the Bill Gates case. So whatever you achieve with your windmills and electric cars, whatever you think you're going to achieve, you're still not going to stop climate changing. And you need to build in more adaptation resilience. Now, to your, your point about efficiency, the, the things your points you're making about the cars, efficient cars, smaller cars, efficiency and so forth, public transit, the car culture, this falls into two buckets. One is the um, what I consider the, the misunderstanding of the nature and role of efficiency in markets. And the other, of course, is human behavior. And, the bo and both of them have to do with uh, living in free societies versus controlled societies. So let's, let's just stipulate that I'm not a fan of the government deciding we know the future and I'm going to tell you how you can live. But I, I am a fan of a debate about convincing people they should live differently. Vaclav Smil, who's I know reasonably well and use his work a lot, brilliant, uh, uh, curmudgeonly prolific energy analyst and writer, uh, is, lives a very aesthetic lifestyle and very unhappy with the profligate ways of the West. And one of his solutions to energy problems and therefore climate is to change people's attitudes about how they should live. Walk, bicycle, small houses, not big houses, et cetera. And he knows that that's a, uh, call it a fool's errand in the sense that you're, you're fighting an uphill battle, but not impossible. It's a cultural thing. It's a long, very long cycle change, change cultures. So first of all, efficiency doesn't decrease demand for energy. It never has. It has the inverse effect. It's the so-called Jevons paradox. It's not a paradox when Jevons wrote his paper back in the uh, 19th century, even though it's called the Jevons Paradox, and he titled his paper, The Paradox, he, he said, it sounds paradoxical, it's not. Efficiency is, is obviously, and things that are essential, food, fuel, entertain, entertainment is essential in, in civilized society. All the things, if you make things cheaper that people want and need, they use more of it. Efficiency makes things cheaper, unless governments stop that, unless governments mandate that you pay more. And so through all of history, efficiency has led to increased consumption. It's not the re rebound effect. That's part of it. It's it, the underlying reality that you make something essential cheaper. You get not only more consumption of the something, but you free up capital for other things that are, it, by, are a priori energy consuming. That's just a philosophical point. On the car point, let me make this point. It's a behavioral thing. You've been able, you, meaning we, all of us have been able to buy extremely efficient small cars for a very long time. Uh, consumers choose not to buy them by and large. They've been, the, the voluntary behavior has been towards bigger cars that are also more efficient. In fact, the average, even though that graph I showed you, I could have showed you two graphs, the average uh, size of a vehicle in America and Europe has increased dramatically. The SUVification of the automobile fleet. Fuel efficiency has also increased dramatically. And the absolute consumption of gasoline or pet petrol in, in, in Europe has actually been trending slightly down. Even so we what people have got in their minds is the best of both worlds. They, they're buying the larger vehicles for personal choice reasons because it's it's it, you know, you can there's been a lot of data on consumer preferences in cars. And so people people buy cars because they they find it offers a whole set of attributes beyond. The energy feature, and they're knowing that it causes carbon dioxide emissions. They all know that. So the problem with mass tra mass transit is very efficient. The most energy efficient way to move people is in a fully loaded bus or a fully loaded airplane or a fully loaded train. They're all sort of in the same range. And the least efficient way to move a human being is a two, you know, one guy or gal and his pilots in a private jet. And the the, the second least is a single occupant car. So we know. I just looked this data up yesterday. So 75% of automobiles are single occupant driven in America and have been for decades, including during the era of climate awareness, you should share, ride share, you know, ride, millennials should ride with each other. Single occupancy driving of vehicles is the norm and has, remains unchanged uh, across cultures and markets uh, as soon as there's even a modest level of affluence. But, but to your point about 
pursuit of efficiency, here's, here's, here's where we can thread the needle on the political requirements and desire to have a way that we are subsidizing, inducing, nudging people to more efficient behaviors, right? To use less oil. Instead of giving flat grants of $10,000 for people to buy a $90,000 or $80,000 car, which is what we're doing, which goes dominantly to the wealthy, as we all know, not, not, to, the, not to people of, of middle and lower incomes. What you would do is an obvious thing. Since we monitor all mileage of all vehicles in every Western country, we know how many miles you've driven the car when you sell it because you have an odometer. We know how, what the efficiency of the car is you drove. You could take the same logic and say, I'm, I'm prepared. Look at the oil slash CO2 save with the $10,000 subsidy. And instead of doing it for a vehicle, allocate it to the person and tell that person that you'll give them that, that amount of dollars in dollars per barrel of oil equivalent or dollars per carbon dioxide pound equivalent when they make a car purchase. So they buy the more efficient car. They might buy a big car with a more efficient engine. The, re the reason automakers don't sell cars that get 35 miles per gallon average is a 25. And you could do that. So the average fleet average is 25 today. It could be 35, but the engines are more expensive. People don't buy them. They exist. You can increase the fuel efficiency of the entire automotive fleet of the world overnight by 50%. You can't do that with batteries because those engines already exist, but they cost more. We don't incentivize them. We don't subsidize them. I don't want to require them, but if we're going to be in a world of subsidies, and we are, and that's not going to change, then my argument would be the way we thread the needle, to your point, I want people to use more, to, to do more, more uh, uh, commuting by, by train and bus. It's going to take, a tech, I think, a decade for the anxieties over COVID to fully relax and get ridership up. I think a lot of subways are going to go bankrupt before that happens. But you counter that with, well, we should build rail lines to the exurbs and suburbs where people have moved. That is actually not energy efficient because they're so underutilized. The only place you have energy efficiency in subways and rails and buses is in dense urban corridors where they're highly utilized. As soon as they're underutilized, as soon as you see a bus driving by 20 people on it, or 10 people or five people, you are looking at a profoundly energy inefficient. So all of these things that showing that subways are efficient, mass transit are efficient, are mythological in the same way that solar is cheap. When it's fully loaded, it's efficient. But you have to know the average loading efficiency of those transports. And what you find in most cases, they're so poorly utilized that they're very inefficient uses both capital and energy. It's just the nature of how humans respond. Not everybody can live 15 minute walk from where they work and not everybody wants to do that. It's just, but if we want to nudge them, I'm, I'm okay. I can, I can live in a world of political compromise. We have to, right? But I want the nudging to be more rational instead of saying electric cars, we're going to ban internal combustion engines. We're going to ban big cars. You know, uh, you probably know this and you probably guess it if you didn't know it, that in the gasoline world, Two thirds of all gasoline is burned in America and in Europe by a, less than one third of drivers. What fifteen percent of drivers? They're called the super users. They're, you know that that's lot, makes sense. Th these are the people you want to to incentivize to drive uh, a more efficient engine. And since they drive so much on their odometer, that you would be giving that. Let's say it's a pickup truck driver. He lives in rural in rural flyover country. And you, you don't want them driving a 15, 20 mile an hour pickup. You want to drive them a 40 mile per gallon pickup. You're going to be able to give them a subsidy at the, at the Tesla level of subsidies that probably pays for half the truck. Since this is so awesome. And if you still have time, I have another question. Oh, good. Sure. I have so time. Then I, I have, I'm looking at the clock. I'm okay. Yeah. People can trailer off. But um, so you went to the Skagen Fund. Um, New Year's conference, the annual conference in Norway. I would like to know how much can you divulge of how you are how you are received. Um, <laughs> like you just have you know killer facts data. Um, how can people hold on to uh, their I don't know more delusional positions after you've confronted them with evidence? So what do they say in public? What do they say to you behind closed doors? Um, how are you received in Europe and also in the US? How are you, how are you received with MIT scientists? Yeah. Same stuff. Well, like 
you know, on average, there's two there's two classes of response. Well, I'm I'm gonna ignore the flame throwing class of response and the ad hominem. So I mean, there are people who just respond by saying that uh, you know you're a shill for the oil industry. You, I mean, those kinds of. I mean, I don't work for the oil industry. Uh, if they hire me to give a speech, I'll give a speech, and they can pay me. Uh, that happens once in a while. I've briefed boards of oil companies because they're obviously concerned about whether their market's going away. <laughs> But the setting aside ad hominem stuff, which is, in my case, has been, it happens. It's more of it on the internet than there is in person. People are are gutless. If you want to, you know, you want to hurl an insult, do it in person, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, they fall into two camps. There, there are uh, people who, who uh, think that I might be right. They're not so sure, but they think it's so important uh, that we, it doesn't change their. It's so important not to burn hydrocarbons. It doesn't change their their worldview. They're not they're not really movable on this, uh, and it's and the immovability I, I see is a failure on my part to have demonstrated that not to denigrate their motivations that why we're moving, but to demonstrate that the techniques to meet their motives are failing. So I'm not. I sort of flip it over when I get that kind of reaction is that we, we just have to try it. You know, we just have to try because it's so important, whether, you know, because of their, because of the magnitude of consequences that they believe are coming on us from, from burning hydrocarbons. And I, I think for a lot of people, it's a sincerely held belief. And I think for many people, it's a honestly and scientifically held belief in their minds. I, I'm not in the apocalypse category. I, I, I'm in the category that we humans have are and will have impacts on the environment. We have had a, a, a demonstrable impact on the heat flux of the surface. That world is warmer, and we've had some impact on that. It's no question. I'm all, but I'm in the that we can't. There's nothing we can do to stop that. Is, is the camp I'm in? Is not in the time frames that have any meaning. That's it's it's a different argument than. Uh, but I'm not in the camp of the apocalypse that the sea levels are going to rise, inundate the world that we're going to all burn up and can't adapt. I just just don't believe the science shows that. But that's not the argument that I'm trying to make. So often the arguments I get dragged into with people is my conviction about the how serious it is we have to solve the problem. I'm, and I try to bring it back to, oh, let's just stipulate that it, if you're right and it's as serious as you think and that people in, in that camp, then we surely should be doing things that are consequential. These are not consequential. If, if the variabilities in the automobile sector, the data show, and I look for people to show me that where my data is wrong, and I'm using IEA data. If the data show that it's entirely possible that the switch to electric vehicles in Europe will increase global CO2 emissions, so just be won't be in Europe, not from the power plants, but from the, the supply chains to build the vehicles, that that possibility is baked into IEA data, even though they don't conclude that. What they say is much more circuitous. We have to work harder to improve the efficiency of supply chains. No kidding. Because it's not possible to do what they're claiming, but they're very um, diplomatic, I would say would be the word to use. They don't, these observations that are in their reports do not show up in the executive summaries. They show up in the reports. The staff is very good about doing this analysis. My problem is that the, their data shows that we're not achieving their goal. We're not likely to achieve their goal, and we're not now achieving their goal. So it's a misalloc about the misallocation of capital. The other response that, that I get is not so much that we have to try harder, and that, which again, I say, I take as my failure of not illuminating why what they're claiming isn't working. It isn't, the, it's, of course it's the case that if we build more windmills and burn less coal, we'll emit less CO2 from the United States. Yes, there'll be some offset from building the windmills, but it'll be a net reduction, of course, but not meaningful. It's not zero, and it's being offset by what China's doing. You have much more benefit to the world to go to India and China, India in particular, where we have more influence, to, keep, to subsidize gas going to them so it's burning it at the price of coal. If you really want to make an impact, subsidize American gas going to India so it's price parallel with coal. Just benchmark it to coal in India. That would cost American consumers money because we'd be subsidizing Indian electricity, which would be morally good for them in a sense we're helping them electrify, they need to. 
it would have a much more bang for the buck than subsidizing EVs here. And it would be our domestic industry producing the natural gas. That, that would be a rational policy, which has, I won't say zero chance of happening, but no chance really. Then the other camp, that I, the most common camp, which, which I will, I'm framing a piece right now to write on this, is, is the technology will get better. So the most common response to my data is that I'm either a Malthusian, which was the deepest cut I've received as an unintended insult in my career. I am the anti-Malthusian. I had at a Hoover Institute meeting, a gentleman stand up and accuse me of being a Malthusian when it came to minerals and the, the resources available to build the machines. Oh man, I said, boy, did I miss it? So I, I, I'm in the camp, there's no limit to the resources we can extract from the earth in a way we find acceptable. That's, my, that's the, to be simplistic, the camp that I'm in. I'm the anti-Malthusian. It may take time to get them in a way we can accept, but we can, get, we can do it. But the conviction that we can make like solar arrays better, batteries better, electric cars better, fission better, fusion happen, it, it'll get better and it'll get better fast. That conviction is the overriding response to what I say. The overriding response is you're, you're locked in the past, Mills. You, you are making extrapolations based on old technology. You underestimate the velocity of new technology. And that is a really deeply baked in belief set in the energy transition sphere that this stuff is getting better. They use the words all the time, exponential change. One of the most common things you'll see in lectures of, ex, of the energy transition is they'll, they'll hold up their smartphone and wave it around. Say, how, look how fast this happened. That's the velocity of technology. So they make category errors and they're seductive category errors. The exponential change of technology, clean tech. So you get the tech label. And that's a more difficult one to respond to because I'm a, my book is, my, my book, The Cloud Revolution is essentially a creed of core that we have far more technology happening far faster than most people realize. Uh, and, and I'm very optimistic about the technologies that are emerging. But I'm, my book's focus is on energy using technologies. The technologies that advance human well-being after we make cheap energy are all things that use energy. Cars use energy, airplanes use energy, pharmaceuticals they use, use energy to be created, supercomputers and AI to fold pr proteins to come up with new vaccines are monstrous energy consuming machines. I mean, we're talking, we're talking steel mill class of electricity consumption to power the AI engines that do protein folding. It's just staggering. There, this is, but the category error is thinking that those velocities apply to wind, tur wind turbines. They don't, they just, they just don't. So you have, to, you have to sort of dig down a level to see where people are making category errors. That's a longer discussion and a harder one. So why, don't, why won't electric batteries get better fast enough to solve the problem? Well, you have to actually explain electrochemistry, the physical chemistry of batteries. The, the, and then you know, it's not the range that matters in electric cars. I'll use this as an example, one of the most common one I get. Electric cars already have their range issue solved. You, you can buy an electric car that has the same range as your gas car. There, there, there's, there's dozens of models. That's not been a problem since the first Tesla S. Two or 300 miles range is plenty. Lots of cars only have two to 300 miles of range. That's not the issue. It's never been the issue. It's, it's a total misdirection. Setting aside cost, cost is the big issue. It's how long it takes to fuel the vehicle. And that's, that's a physics problem. It's tied to the physics of electricity, um, moving power at those levels into, into vehicles and to the electrophysics, electrochemistry of, of batteries when you push push energy as a charge into a battery. It's really different than a liquid. It, they don't, it's not the same. And it, those are problems that are really, really hard to solve. They may not, they may, they're not impossible to solve. They're really hard to solve. And they result in extremely ex expensive, inefficient and slow ways to refuel a vehicle. So the, the vehicle that is refueled overnight is not useful except to the beyond obvious, the cohort of the market puts a second car and they, they don't care. Eight hours to recharge it every few days, whatever. You plug it in. It's a very convenient second car. But on the road, when you stop to fill your car with gasoline, and we all have, I started timing my, my personal experience on this. Time it sometime. For the time you pull into the pump, fill up and leave, see how long it was. Not, I don't want you going and buying, you know, some water or, you know, some gum, but just how long does it take? You'll be shocked. It's like three minutes, four minutes, two minutes, five minutes. It's minutes. That's the average refuel time. 
put that much energy into a battery with a supercharger at three to 400 kilowatts is 20 minutes to 40 minutes, depending on the supercharger in the car. 20 minutes versus three to four. Okay, does that matter? Do you really care? It's, you know what? It, when you start modeling out human behavior and what really matters when you're on the road and you're driving, uh, occasionally stopping for 20 minutes for a break is, is common. People do not like waiting 20 minutes to a half hour. And more important in the economics of that, that business, because you can't change that. These are really expensive machines. They cost much more than a gasoline pump. They cost three times more than a gasoline pump. And you need three times as many of them. Let's just use five minutes for the car and 15 minutes for the electric car. That means to have, handle the same peak loading at the same location, you need three pumps. Because peak loading matters. If you're trying to move people through, you've got to have, you've got to have, you can't, can't have people waiting in a long line. It doesn't work for gasoline stations or fueling stations. So these things are sort of immutably locked into the machines we know how to build. So I remind people that you can build what we know how to build today. If you come up with an imagine, imaginary new technology that we could design to be buildable later, fine. That's not what we're building. You're building what you know how to build today. We know a lot about those things. And they create all these barriers. So then people say, oh, we'll make it better. Okay. Why don't we wait till it's better? And I'll deploy that technology because the better is what we want. And you don't get to the better by mandating yesterday's technology. So you get in regulatory world to get the, what's known as lock-in, right? If you start mandating and subsidizing things that exist today, you, you get lock-in. People that know how to do those things, build those things and sell them. You don't spend money and put up with the market competition to get to the metric that the market wants, which is fast fueling. Unless it's again mandated. So then you're, you're going down the path that everything is done by diktat because we, we discover that people don't want to spend a third of the time on a trip fueling, which is what you do today with an EV if you take a long trip. So you have you, what you would have is two cars, the one you drive for the long trip and the one you drive around town, which is a net good. I mean, what I think that's a great outcome. What's wrong with that? If you want more of that, maybe we, you know, does that deserve incentives? I don't know. I guess I'm I'm okay a little bit with that, but it really offends me that the incentives are all going to the wealthy. We just know we know from both facts and and surveys that it's a inverse wealth transfer. The taxes that pay for the subsidies are from the 80 percent, and the 20 percent are enjoying them. And we're doing it in the name of climate. But then back to the point you you all know is true is that you're actually getting far less of an impact because people aren't driving them long distances, even though they claim they are. They aren't. We know this. By the way, Berkeley did a very clever study. They they looked at the electric uh, loads of ho houses going, anonymized data from the California Public Utility Commission, going back 10 years, uh, uh, houses with electric cars, without electric cars, to look at how much electricity, more electricity they were using. Um, and uh, what, they, what they deduced from that was that the average miles driven by the average electric vehicle owner, which is mostly Teslas there, is 5,000 miles, which is half the, half the US average. Other surveys have found the same thing. Uh, it's not th th them, but they did it by not asking people. They didn't look at the odometers. They just looked at the fuel they were using because of where they charged. So, I, and it's, it's an interesting. It's an interesting problem, though, to see. And I don't. I don't. I, but I. I. What I don't. I, I don't feel alone out there trying to you know argue these things. But I do feel like I'm in a, in a distinct minority. Team up with Hans Van Azin, the German guy. You'll make a great team. Well, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> we finally come to an end, and this has been a fascinating lesson in eye-popping fact. Thank you, Mark Mills. <laughs> thank you, Harvey. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the for the the brave the few that stayed for the overage. And I, I appreciate your your patience and attention and your questions. Or good questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.